Good evening, and welcome to the new Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, this is the uh, house that John Hamry built, and uh, I'm privileged to work for John Hamry and, and uh, thank him as much as possible for uh, putting us in this new building. We are truly, truly fortunate to be here. Um, some of my other bosses are on the way, uh, one of them being Sam Nunn, our chairman, so I wanted to acknowledge him, and Sue Cobb, our, uh, one of our trustees, General Scowcroft and Fred Kasrabi, uh, I believe are also on the way. Thank you all for coming out on a, you know, Washington weather night. This is truly, uh, and it'll be well worth it, because this is a truly remarkable panel that we have. Um, I'd like to start by um, giving a few congratulations to Bob Schieffer. One, um, you see on this banner that uh, the TCU Schieffer School of Journalism, well, it's been renamed. It's now the, the TCU Schieffer College of Communication. So congratulations, Bob. That's a real milestone. Um, the second bit of news about Bob Schieffer is um, Bob, as some of you may know, hosts a little show called Face the Nation. Um, last November in November Sweeps, which is the big marker for all network television, Face the, Face the Nation averaged 3.58 million viewers, which was the show's best sweep in over 25 years. And it was first in every household in the United States of America uh, among viewers and adults aged 25 to 54. Face the Nation is the number one Sunday public affairs show. Congratulations. And while everybody continues to roll in, there are plenty of seats. Um, and if there aren't seats, um, you can stand in the back and we can also have a little bit of concourse seating. But I'd also really like to thank um, our benefactor, uh, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation uh, and Vasily Tsamias, who is here. Uh, Vasily, could you stand up? I'm, I'm not sure where you are. Uh, Vasily, I want, oh, there you are. Vasily, I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation um, is a uh, real, a truly, significant partner for CSIS in both an intellectual sense um, and in uh, a sense of support. And we thank them for everything they're doing for us. And um, we just are so glad that you could make it down also from New York in this terrible weather. Um, with that, I'd like to hand it over to Bob Schieffer. Mr. Einhart, why don't you just start us off by telling us what is this deal? What are we talking about here? And, and what does it encompass and what what did both sides hope to get out of it? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't call it a deal, a complete deal. It's, uh, I call it a preparatory deal, a preliminary deal. Uh, it was designed by the US and its partners really to stop the clock, uh, to stop the clock on Iran's nuclear program. Uh, it, uh, the program could advance substantially in coming months. Uh, this uh, deal very comprehensively and for six months puts a cap on that program. All the issues that you've read about, this Iraq plutonium reactor, the Fordo enrichment facility, the advanced centrifuges, all those things have been uh, capped. So while they're negotiating over the six, ne next six months for a comprehensive deal, there'll be no advancement in the program. And that's very, very important. Uh, also, uh, there are some innovative verification uh, procedures, so we can be very confident uh, that Iran is not, in fact, advancing its program. The inspectors for the uh, in International Atomic Energy Agency will be able to visit the key facilities every day, which is it's usually once every week or two weeks. Uh, they'll be going to some facilities they haven't had access to before, uh, play workshops where the uh, Iranians produce centrifuges, uh, uranium uh, mines, it's important to get a handle on uranium ore and yellow cake from the beginning. Uh, so it's very well ver verified. Uh, in exchange for that, of course, there's some sanctions easing measures. Uh, that's the uh, principal reason Iran is interested in negotiations, to uh, get relief from the sanctions that are having a crippling effect on their uh, economy. Uh, and by estimates of the administration, the sanctions easing steps will be worth, uh, at most, about $7 billion dollars for the six-month period. Uh, but that compares uh, to uh, roughly $30 billion it, during the six-month period uh, that, they'll law, that they'll lose in oil revenues compared to the six-month period before the sanction, oil sanctions were imposed. Uh, I've seen estimates that the total sanctions uh, bill uh, for Iran is about $100 billion a year. 
Uh, and so uh, se up to seven billion is, is, is very small. Uh, so I think they're getting a freeze on uh, Iran's uh, program for very little. They're also getting a slight rollback. Uh, if you remember uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, his cartoon character, you know, cartoon bomb at the, at the UN, uh, he talked about the accumulation of enriched uranium, enriched to 20% level, which gets you near to weapons grade. And he said uh, that when it's, once it gets to two, 250 kilograms, uh, that's his red line. Uh, well, this deal rolls it back to zero uh, in that category uh, because the, 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 the most worrisome form of 20% enriched uh, is either put into a powdered form or diluted to below 5%. So uh, it, 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 it does a lot. But all of this is preparatory to a final deal. Uh, and there's some general principles agreed to uh, in the document from November 24th. Uh, and they talk about um, a long-term agreement. They couldn't reach agreement on exactly how long that would be. Uh, they talk about uh, a mutually defined uh, uranium enrichment program. Uh, that would only be agreed if there's also agreement on specific limits and monitoring measures uh, to make sure that uh, Iran doesn't have the capability to b break out of constraints suddenly and uh, quickly get enough highly enriched uranium for bombs. Um, but you know, key issues were really put off. The disposition of this plutonium production reactor, they couldn't agree on that. They put it off to the final deal. The uh, disposition of this uh, uh, underground uranium enrichment facility off into the future. Uh, so, uh, you know, the next six months will be very hard negotiations. It's uh, the president just the other day said he gave it about a 50 50 uh, possibility of actually reaching a final deal. But I think it's a very promising first step. So, I would just ask you to is this a good deal or a bad deal? Uh, where are we here? What do you think of it, Dr. Brzezinski? I think it's a good deal, considering the context in which it was being pursued, and considering the legacies of the last X number of years in which the relationship became increasingly antagonistic, dominated by suspicions, some very justified, and in which the alternative, of course, in the absence of the deal, probably would have been some sort of a military collision, a military collision which, in a short sort of sense, we would probably initially win, but which would probably plunge us into a much more prolonged, much wider regional conflict. So yes, I think this is a good beginning. But as we were just told, it has a long way to go, and the difficult parts are still ahead. What about it, Tom? Yeah, I, I support it. I think it was a, a good deal. I think it was well negotiated. Um, under the circumstances, I, I think the thing to keep in mind, at least has, has really shaped my own thinking, is I think the sanctions regime was at its apex. That is, we, we probably enlisted as many people as we were going to enlist um, uh, in the age of Ahmadinejad. Let's remember, you know, Iran was led uh, um, for this uh, last was a decade, I guess, um, by uh, a president who was so obnoxious, uh, uh, so foul, uh, a Holocaust-denying, um, uh, you know, really bad guy, he was the gift they kept on giving. Because um, uh, it was very easy, or relatively easy, to maintain an international sanctions regime with Iran headed by this kind of person. Um, he was gone. He's replaced by uh, someone uh, much more sophisticated, uh, and a foreign minister much more uh, adept at dealing with the West and the world. And um, I think also we have to see this in the context of the last Iranian election, um, which is the precursor to all of this negotiation. So Iran just had a presidential election in which the supreme leader and his guides allowed six men to run. Uh, and their names were Mr. Black, Mr. Black, Mr. Black. Mr. Black, Mr. Black, and Mr. Light Black. And lo and behold, 51% uh, of Iranians decide they're all going to go for Mr. Light Black. I'm actually told the true number was 64%. Um, but the, the Supreme Leader was so freaked out 
by so many people going for the guy who just was a little more moderate than everybody else and really wanted to try an opening with the West. And so I think the external conditions and the internal conditions in Iran right now were the ideal moment to test, and that's all this is, but it's a legitimate test, whether Iran can be a partner for a secure deal that allows them to enrich at the level of their electrical needs and nothing more. I, uh, <clears throat> I was very interested that I read in the, I think it was in the Atlantic, that Rouhani has more cabinet members with PhDs from American universities. He has more of those in his cabinet than President Obama <laughs> does. <laughs> um, his, uh, His chief of staff uh, was formerly the head of the Chamber of Commerce and um, Iran's chief trade negotiator. Kind of tells you, also American PhD, educated PhD. Mm -hmm. But does that really make a difference, Dr. Brzezinski? Is that something that, uh, uh, is this a, is Rouhani a, a different kind of leader? Tom's talking about black, 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 and, and, and light black. Uh, well, I think that sort of defines it. Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps even more than that, I mean, he was part of the revolution. He was part of that elite that ushered in an era of intense hostility with the United States. But he appears to be also a person who has evolved with time and who has begun to think in a somewhat different fashion. And I think that is worthy of exploitation. Moreover, and I think that's maybe even more important, Iran is changing. Iran, I think, was swept up by a revolutionary passion, which to some extent was derived from a rather historically legitimate resentment of foreign domination, foreign exploitation, perhaps even extreme interference in Iranian internal affairs that united the Iranians in a kind of nationalistic passion and self-assertion. But then 20, 30 years followed of increasing misery, frustration, fundamentalist extremism, and a significant part of the Iranian population increasingly began to view this as a kind of reactionary, counterproductive, self-destructive regime that needs to be altered, preferably peacefully. And these elections are, in a sense, a signal that there is in Iran a population, now perhaps a majority even, certainly in the, in the urban areas, that wants to be more like, for example, Turkey. And I know Iran a little bit, and I know Turkey a little more, but my sense is that Iran has as strong a chance of being a democratic country as Iran has, in so, terms of education, history, orientation, and so forth. So who then is driving this in Iran? Is it the general, or are the generals doing it, or is it these in more enlightened people that are more familiar with the West? Uh, is it the theocrats? Is it the bureaucrats? Who, who, who is the driving force there, do you I, think? I'll tell you, what is the driving force? The driving force is the sanctions. Uh, I think that is the incentive. That's why Iran has come to the negotiating table. I think that's why a majority, whether 51 or 64 percent of the Iranian people, voted for Rouhani. Uh, because there's some way to get out from under these sanctions. It was also people like uh, the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who uh, really uh, feel, felt that their country had become a pariah. Uh, they didn't want to be isolated. They wanted to be part of the international community. Uh, and you know, when, when you, saw, you saw pictures of uh, the uh, Tehran airport when the negotiating team came back from Geneva, there were these young faces, jubilant faces, uh, what were they uh, so happy about? It wasn't because they may have gotten a right to enrich. Uh, they didn't know what was in the nuclear deal. They were happy because they saw pictures of the American Secretary of State and their foreign minister shaking hands and smiling at one another. I think there's a large community, especially of young people, who've had enough of this isolation and want to be part of the world again. Then why is Israel so much against this? Or are they? I mean, we know what Netanyahu is saying, but uh, Tom? That's a very good question. Um, ne next question over here. Um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, look, uh, even paranoids have enemies, as um, uh, Dr. Kissinger said, and um, uh, the fact is, under Ahmadinejad, you, you did have a regime that in, you know, 
they'll always say, well, that wasn't exactly the right translation of we want to wipe you off the map. We, you know, um, but uh, you know, we had a regime and a leader who made extremely uh, hostile, aggressive statements about Israel, as I said, was a Holocaust denier, building a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <coughs> I, I, I think any Israeli leader, um, that included even Ehud Olmert, uh, who was not Netanyahu, uh, believed that uh, it was prudent uh, for Israel to uh, take steps to try to engineer global sanctions and even, if necessary, threaten war um, to ensure that Iran did not get a nuclear weapon. My, my you know, uh, so I, I don't think that, that that's wrong or, or um, was, uh, was crazy at all. Um, I, I do, though, I, I have been critical of the fact that I think that it, it can't also be an excuse for not working on the Israeli-Palestinian front, and I think there, there are people who suspect that to some degree it is. Nevertheless, it was a legitimate, uh, it's a legitimate threat. But what you have in Israel is a lot of diversity of opinion about what Israel should do about it. We know the former intelligence chiefs um, and many former generals have come out and come out against any military option mm -hmm. and really believe that now is the time to cash in on the sanctions. Now, Israel's view was that um, we, we, uh, we cashed in our sanctions too early. We should have doubled down on the sanctions and uh, to the point where Iran would have basically evacuated its whole program. There, there's no experts I know of on Iran, um, uh, in this country at least. Uh, well, I, I'm not going to say no, but I think the majority of experts, the people that Bob uh, works with, don't believe that. I mean, we've been doubling down on sanctions, and Iran has just kept building its program. And uh, there was every reason to believe, having sacrificed this much, they, they would have gone all the way or, or one screwdriver away. So. Um, you know, I think that uh, the challenge for Israel will be to um, not allow just what Iran is trying to prevent, which is to be isolated, to um, be split off from the global consensus uh, and be split off from the United States. And um, I, I noticed that Netanyahu has quieted down a lot in the last couple of weeks, because I think one thing he saw was, um, after really sending two ministers here and really trying to generate a lot of opposition um, with Israel's allies up on the hill, that at the end of the day, the Congress really sided with the president on this one, and um, uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so I hope the Israelis will, you know, I, I think there is a value of, of having um, a threat, a, a pistol on the table when negotiating with Iran. Um, and uh, uh, you always want to have leverage on your side, and you shouldn't take anything off the table. But I, I think we should let this play out now, and uh, I think that's in Israel's best interest. Wow. Yeah, you can ask the question, if, if we have so much leverage now, why don't we put it to use? Why don't we give it a try? Right. Maybe they won't accept it. Let's give it a try. There's a reason for that, because you know, until now, the Iranians have been the intransigent party. We've been the reasonable one. If we ask uh, for an outcome that no one believes is achievable, we will become the intransigent side. Uh, we have counted on being the reasonable side in order to get support for the sanctions regime. If we look like we're not interested in a deal, then our partners in this international sanctions coalition uh, will, uh, they, they'll, they'll leave the coalition. Uh, and we need that pressure over the next six months uh, to get Iran to accept an acceptable final deal. And I think that's one of the risks of kind of going for a maximalist position. Dr. Brzezinski, uh I noticed that you tweeted. I didn't know you tweeted, but I see that <laughs> you <my> did. Sins. <laughs> uh, you said, Obama, Kerry, best policy team since Bush, Jim Baker. Congress is finally becoming embarrassed by Netanyahu's efforts to dictate U.S. policy. Well, I think there's something to that. <laughs> That's why I tweeted it. <laughs> exactly. Talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, we're all engaged in maneuvers, and uh, one can only decipher what might be the motives of particular maneuvers. But I think it's fair to say that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu expected the agreement not to appear. Uh, I think he was rather surprised that it did. I, a lot of people in this country were surprised. And I think one also has to take note of the fact that this was an agreement not just between the United States and Iran, although those were the principal parties, but an agreement which involved also Russia and China and Europe. And I think that is a very important step forward in the sense that it creates a kind of a framework on which to build 
and it commits these countries also to, in a sense, an outcome which is vaguely being previewed without being overly specific. I think we all have a common interest in Iran not deteriorating into a total social failure, mm -hmm. a fundamentalist extremist, and a source of violence. And I think that is shared by many Israelis, and this is why Israeli public opinion, as far as I can sense, but Tom knows it much better, is not all that enthused with Netanyahu's <coughs> tactics or assertions. You know, I would just point out that the uh, day after the agreement was signed, the Tel Aviv stock market went up. And that's rather telling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> As, as you all know, there is talk in, in the Senate to go ahead and passing a sanctions bill that will go into effect if there's no progress made within six months. I'd just like to get the, what each of you thinks the impact of that would be. Would that be a good thing, or, or in your view, or is it uh, something not so good? Uh, I don't think it would be a good thing. Uh, the, the view you is, do not think I don't would. think it would be a good thing. Um, the view is if you know, some sanctions are good, more sanctions much, must be better. Uh, I don't think more sanctions are even needed at this point. These sanctions are having a crippling effect. They brought Iran to the table. They've made significant concessions in this interim deal. Uh, they know uh, that if they drag their feet and, there isn't, and they don't negotiate seriously over the next six months, the Congress can pass a new sanctions bill immediately, at any, at any time. It'll take them 24 hours, less than 24 hours to do that. Uh, why does it have to be done now? There's actually a provision in the interim deal that says the U.S. will refrain from imposing additional sanctions. Now, you know, if, the, if, if it's a kind of delayed trigger on a sanctions law and doesn't take effect for six months, maybe that's not inconsistent with the letter of the agreement. But it seems to be inconsistent, certainly, with the spirit of the agreement. And the Iranians have said that if there are new sanctions, uh, that will be a violation of the agreement. And hardliners in Iran will take advantage of that, and they'll undercut the negotiating authority of the Iranian negotiating team. I think it'll make things very difficult. Well, uh, I think we can always have sanctions. We will have sanctions. If there's not a deal after six months and the Iranians are not negotiating seriously, there will be more sanctions. We just don't need to do it now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, President Obama and Secretary Kerry are, I mean, their um, reputations are on the line too now. They've, they've struck this deal. They said this is a proper framework for negotiating. If Iran tweets, or if Iran, sorry, cheats, <laughs> you've really got into my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if Iran cheats, <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, uh, I think they'll be the first to call for more sanctions. I mean, they would be extremely embarrassed. They would be politically very vulnerable. Their worst critics would have been proven true. Let's give it a chance. Let's give it a proper, clear, clean lab test. But uh, it, it, and I'll ask you, Dr. Brzezinski, you, you do not think holding this out would make it easier to make a deal if, if this is already on the books. Let's remember the sanctions still exist. We're, the yeah. sanctions haven't been lifted. But I mean, this yeah. would be more sanctions yeah. if you don't go ahead and close the deal. Well, at some point we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is it that we can live with and be reasonably confident that Iran is not in a position to use the nuclear weapon in some fashion that gives it some benefit. Um, unless one becomes a believer that the Iranians are hell-bent on committing suicide, and therefore the moment they have the first allegedly bomb, they'll attack Israel. One has to ask oneself, you know, is the assumption behind that that this country is totally suicidal, that the leadership wishes the country to be destroyed, is going to attack with the first assumed nuclear weapon, a country which has 200 nuclear weapons and has the capacity to deliver them. I think at some point we'll, ha we'll have to think about that dilemma. And I am of the view that at some point, probably in the course of these negotiations, when, as they're being finalized, we will have to go more on record, that is to say the United States, that we will, under any circumstance of a threat from Iran directed at Israel, react the same way we would have reacted at any threat by the Soviet Union at Europe, our principal ally, or the same way as we're still committed 
to reacting on behalf of the Japanese or the Koreans, South Koreans, if threatened by North Korea. That is to say that that action is tantamount to an attack on the United States. Now, this is a further reinforcement of a situation in which Iran may end up with a nuclear program. And the nuclear program may always have some potential for breakout. But it provides, I think, a reassurance. And in that context, it's also useful to remind ourselves that achieving a nuclear capability is much more complicated than having a theoretical capability for making a weapon. And you know, there is sort of a public assumption, uh, which has been fostered to some extent by Netanyahu, that the Iranians are just months away from having a weapon. But the point is, having a weapon doesn't mean anything. If you have a so-called weapon, first of all, you have to test it. You better make sure it works if you're intent on committing effective suicide. That is to say, to take a lot of other people with you. Then secondly, you have to have a delivery system that is reliable. So it has to be tested too. And then thirdly, presumably, unless you're totally, totally suicidal, which is hard to assign as a characteristic of a nation of 80 mil million people that's endured for 3,000 years, you have to have some sense that you want to have a capacity to, to retaliate if you are struck. Now, all of that will take an enormous amount of time to achieve. So what I'm trying to say is even if we're not positioned in a perfect <coughs> way to achieve a truly, truly, absolutely foolproof agreement with the Iranians that in effect precludes them from being co-equal with a lot of other uh, nuclear generating nations, uh, we have that option. And I think we ought to exercise it on behalf of stability in the region and guarantee not just Israel, which may be offended, offended by being guaranteed by us, but anyone in the region whom the Iranians could threaten with their nuclear weapons. And let me make one final point. What we don't really pay much attention to, that the fact is that the real nuclear player in that region is someone else. It's not Iran, and in my judgment, it's not going to be soon. Pakistan. Pakistan has a lot of nuclear weapons, and it's increasing the range of its delivery capabilities. That is food for thought. You know, Bakar, I just add something yeah. to what uh, Zvig Pony made. And I, one of the weaknesses I've always found in, in a certain uh, school of Israeli analysis of the countries around them, which they tend to relate to through newspapers, I mean, I talk about the Mossad or whatnot, but daily, is that, I mean, if you talk to Netanyahu, Israel has politics. In fact, he's, his hands are tied on the peace process. If he does anything, the head of Shas or some party's going to come in. If he doesn't install a kosher kitchen in the Ministry of Interior by 5 o'clock, he's out of government. You know, I mean, just, it just, you know, my hands are tied. We have politics in Israel. Saudi Arabia has politics. Turkey has politics. America has politics. Only Iran has no politics. All 80 million people want to get a bomb and drop it on the Jews the next day. That's, that's basically what we are being told. And I think one of the predicates, one of the presuppositions of this deal is actually Iran has more politics, or as much politics as any country in that region. And if you open up the cleavage by easing the sanctions and rewarding people who want to have greater outreach with the outside world and actually deliver something for them that they can then leverage in their internal politics, you also begin to change the whole equation. And that's very much part of the presuppositions of this deal. Uh, Bob, let me ask you this. Let's say we make a deal. How can we be sure that the Iranians aren't cheating on us? Are our technical capabilities good enough that we can be reasonably certain that when we make a deal, we'll know if they break it? Mm. This, the interim deal, uh, we have very high confidence that the International Atomic Energy Agency can verify every element of that. That's really not a problem. The, the more problematic issue will come in a final deal if one is concluded. Uh, and there you have to do something uh, more difficult. You have to uh, be confident that they don't have a covert program, clandestine program. Now, uh, the Iranians don't have a good track record at keeping a covert program covert. Uh, they mm -hmm. had a, uh, an enrichment program, uh, the enrichment facility at Natanz, the uh, MEK, a dissident group, outed it. Uh, they had another covert enrichment program at, uh, near the holy city of Qom, 
uh, Western intelligence agencies discovered it in, uh, uh, and in during uh, 2009. Uh, it's made, I think, the Iranians a bit wary of uh, of being able to keep a covert program covert, and they paid a very high price for those. They, you know, they, they, you know, the price they paid was crippling sanctions. Their, econ their economy is uh, in the gutter now, uh, and so they're going to be wary of doing this. But uh, we're going to have to insist on some very intrusive verification measures uh, to be able to give some measure of confidence that they don't have covert facilities going forward. What do you think the best deal? could be that from a practical standpoint. I mean, we know what Prime Minister Netanyahu says, you know, just everything. Stop everything, dismantle everything. What, what do you think the best we can do? Well, you know, I think the President has more or less said it, but I think it's that you reduce Iran's enrichment capability um, uh, down to the level required for it to generate the electricity it claims it needs and is the justification for this program, and you convert its heavy water reactor to light water, mm -hmm. um, and you have intrusive inspections um, uh, on everything else. And I think uh, Bob is a real expert on this, and I'd be interested in his thoughts, but I think then you're, you're putting a year, year and a half between any breakout capability um, uh, for a Would that be program. the goal, really, I mean, when you come right down to it, to keep them a year and a half away from... Like, to keep them wrong. substantially let, away. Yeah. Let, let me, conceptually, what we're trying to do, what I think we should be trying to do. Um, we want to be able to detect uh, any effort at breaking out of constraints immediately. That's why you have daily inspections. Uh, you want an enrichment program that's so tightly constrained in numbers of centrifuges and an enriched uranium available so that the breakout timeline is long. That the breakout timeline is a time from you know, breakout decision till they have enough uh, highly enriched uranium for a bomb. You want that as long as possible. Uh, why do you want it as long as possible? So that you can intervene to stop them from yes. building a nuclear weapon. That's the critical thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, people say it should be three months or six months or 12 months before they do it. It's a kind of subjective question. Uh, the real issue is, does the international community have the will to intervene once they've detected it? And that's a, that's a key question. Uh, if you have great confidence that the U.S. or Israel or somebody is going to intervene to prevent a bomb from being built, uh, then, you know, it could be three months. If you have no confidence, it can be 18 months or two years, and it's not adequate. So that's a critical element of it. And the international, if a deal is, con is, is concluded, the international community has got to reach agreement that if there's a violation or if there's a breakout, then there will be firm consequences and predictable consequences. To me, that's a critical element. No, I have no problem with that, except it's hard for me to imagine firm commitments by the international community that there would be consequences if by that is meant that the international community would be prepared to do something. Ultimately, <coughs> it would be either the United States alone or conceivably with someone else, but I frankly find it hard to imagine who that someone else would be. Um, I think what we have to add to what has been said, with most of which I agree, is this. We have to operate in a fashion that a volatile political entity, which is an 80 million nation, is not driven into circumstances in which it feels somehow or other its identity, its self-pride, its status requires them again to engage in surreptitious efforts to obtain nuclear weapons. And that is a political calculus. And that, I conclude, leads me to the view that we have to be also sensitive of their pride and their status. There are a lot of nations that have signed the NPT, and we have to be able to find some sort of a measure that puts them somewhere in that category while precluding the ability to engage in a rapid and significant nuclear program, which is what they tried to do, but which they failed to achieve, in part because it's not easy to hide. It's not easy to hide. And if we have all of these additional inspections that we'll now be having, it's going to be increasingly difficult to do that. So we have to be careful not to slide in the position in which an accommodation to the majority of Iranians begins to look like a one-sided capitulation. 
Bob, I, I'd have something that, um, uh, to elaborate on some things Vig said earlier. Um, uh, if I were 40 years younger and back in, in college looking for a PhD thesis, um, uh, it would be called Iraq 1991 to 2003. And um, uh, it would be about what the UN sanctions did to basically crush Iraqi society. So that when we finally did invade Iraq, we didn't find people throwing flowers at us. We found people really, um, really a society that had been devastated uh, by international sanctions. And we are still praying, paying the price today. In Iraq, we've already left. Of, uh, we didn't you know, crush that society because of the leader they had. But I'm talking about, you know, that's why I think this is an ideal moment to bring these, this sanctions regime and test it if we can get negotiations. This is a great civilization. This is not um, you know, some desert you know, uh, country. This is a great civilization, has enormous potential, um, uh, given a different uh, you know, approach to its own future. I want to- Can uh, I just add one more yes, point? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important point. And I just want to add to it the following. We have to take into account the Iranian memories of recent times. During the Iraqi, Iranian war. The Iraqis were using chemical weapons yeah. against the Iranians. Guess who was helping Iraq select and hit targets? I don't even want to say it, but you all know what the answer is. It embarrasses me so much. I, I, I want to uh, go to the question, but let me just ask one question, and then we'll go to, the, uh, to all of you for, some, for your question. How does Syria figure into all of this? Who'd like to talk about that? Well, certainly as a complication, because it's going to be an additional factor in the course of the next few months. Namely, is it going to be a terrain in which we have to be engaged in some sort of forcible solution, in which case a collision with Iran, at least on a limited scale, is more likely? Or is it going to be something that, on that international umbrella uh, that is now extant, we will be able to achieve some sort of progress and therefore calm down that aspect that otherwise could be very inflammatory to the relationship. Tom. Well, but what I would say is your, your question really is a reminder, and I think, again, it's often forgotten um, by some members of Congress, that we, we actually have independent interests in this region from any of our allies or enemies, that we um, approach this region in a different way. We are ending a decade in which post 9-11, we decided we were gonna to try to deal with this region directly with boots on the ground. Um, and that has proven extremely costly um, uh, to people there and to us, and we, we know the whole story. Yet we still have an interest, uh, even more than ever, in a stable Middle East. Well, one way we wanna stabilize this region is the traditional way of balance of forces, balance of power. And part of that balance is between Sunnis and Shiites, okay? Um, and let's not remember, let's not forget, because Ra the Iranians certainly don't. I was in Tehran and interviewed Javad Zarif about this in 2002, that Iran played a vital role in helping us defeat the Taliban, which was also their enemy, a fundamentalist Sunni militia. And when we want to get out of Afghanistan and preserve some of our gains there, we will need Iran again as an ally in this. So we have interests in this region and in a relationship with Iran to both balance you know, the Sunni part of the Arab world, and to deal with uh, Northern Asia, Pakistan, and, uh, and Afghanistan after we leave, in which we have a lot of shared interests. Now, Syria is a, is a place of confrontation, but what's happened is, basically, is that the sanctions regime disguised the very divergent interests of all the parties underneath, okay? Particularly Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the United States. So, um, Saudi Arabia, um, wants a Iran that has no nuclear weapon, but it also wants a weak Iran, period, paragraph, end it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it does not want a strong Shiite Persian competitor, second largest oil producer in the region. And we've had a very unnatural situation 34 years ago. Iran was like, it was the Middle East was like a family and the big brother Iran one day walked out and slammed the door. This is a big took his shoes. I took his bed, Bob took his bicycle. Mm -hmm. And we all got used to having our own totally monopolized relationship with Uncle Sam. One day, 34 years later, knock, knock, big brother's back. 
He wants his bicycle, his tennis shoes, his bed, and his own relationship, oh my God, with Uncle Sam. And the region is freaked out. And that's the psychology of what's going on. Did you want to say anything on that? Well, let's go right here. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your time today, and thank you for your service. Uh, my name is Josh Rogan. I'm a reporter with the Daily Beast website here in Washington. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, first of all, it seems pretty clear that the number one point of contention as this deal goes to Congress is the, the tentative plan to negotiate uh, the, Iran's ability to maintain some level of Iranian enrichment, albeit under safeguards. Now, my question is, uh, how can we be sure, since such a, uh, uh, safeguards would depend on continuous monitoring and valuations and inspections, uh, that that won't allow Iran to maintain its status as a threshold nuclear weapon state uh, ad infinitum? In other words, can a final deal that allows Iran to have any uranium enrichment capacity really be considered final? And my second very quick unrelated follow-up is from Mr. Einhorn, and that is, what about North Korea? If they're uh, uh, ramping up their own uranium enrichment program, is there a possibility that that could become Iran's store of highly enriched uranium just located in another location? Thank you. You want to go first? Yeah. On the uh, enrichment program, um, I think the Iranians are going to be surprised at how token the P5 plus 1 require its enrichment program to be. Uh, the, uh, the joint plan of action that was agreed uh, uh, talked about a, a, a mutually defined enrichment program consistent with practical needs. Now, the way the P5 plus 1 governments view those practical needs is very limited. They have an enrichment, they have a research reactor in Tehran that already has enough fuel for a few decades. It, uh, they have a power reactor at Bushir that the Russians provide fuel for. They don't need any fuel for that. On the drawing board, they have some other research reactors planned, but they haven't broken ground on them. For the foreseeable future, they have very little practical need. So I think the P5 plus 1 are in the rights to call for a very, very limited enrichment program, which would provide very little breakout uh, capability. Um, on the North Korean case, uh, I think these are uh, very, very difficult, different cases. Uh, the North Koreans have, you know, cheated from day one. They've had nuclear weapons. Uh, they, in 1992, they agreed with the South Koreans not to have enrichment or reprocessing capabilities, even if there is a limited enrichment program allowed in a final deal with Iran. I don't think the North Koreans can legitimately say we want one too. All right, here we are. Go ahead. Good. Yeah, Mohammed Hussaini from the Arab League. Um, I wonder here whether really the Israelis are really concerned or seriously concerned about the Iranian nuclear program. Perhaps they are more concerned psychologically. If we know that they are, are the only power in the region that possess nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, the second in the world may be next to the North Korea. Now, is it really, or is it to, uh, to, to, to make the, the, uh, the, 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 to divert the attention of the Arab countries from the main conflict, the main issue, the Arab-Israeli conflict, to the Iranian threat, so that they make us believe that it's really the threat is not Israel, it's the Iran, and it's working, it seems. The Arab world is buying billions of dollars, with billions of dollars now, weapons. And Hegel just now, yesterday, is talking about a, a missile umbrella for defense of the Gulf countries only. Thank you. Uh, I must say, the microphone is distorting. It was up here. It's very difficult. Exactly. I had the same reaction. Uh, I couldn't understand it. Could you just say that without speaking into the microphone? It, it, it distorted your voice. Give me the thrust of your question again. Uh, I'm just saying that I wonder whether the, whether the Israelis are really concerned are the Israelis really concerned? Okay. Uh, about the Iranian nuclear program. About the Iranian program. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps they are psychologically more concerned. We know that it's at the bargain and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, or is it really the, a way of diverting the conflict of the Arab countries from the main conflict, which is 
Well, you know, let me just, I, I get okay. the point. Um, okay. uh, let me just say, uh, if you talk to the Arab countries today, they're a lot more concerned about Iran than they are about the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, if, you, if you listen to what's coming out of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, uh, uh, the Gulf countries in particular. So they're, they're, if anyone's diverting things, what we have is a tacit alliance, been quite written about, between Israel and Saudi Arabia now, where they're both obsessed with the Iran um, issue. Now, one could argue, you know, this is unprovable, you know, that each one has its interest in diverting attention from you know, domestic issues, whether it's Israel, the Israel-Palestinian thing, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, um, in the wake of the Arab Spring, not wanting to, people to focus on that question. But to suggest that the Arab countries really want to talk about the Israel-Palestine question, and only Israel wants to talk about Iran, I think would be a complete misreading of what's actually going on in the region. The reason we have this tacit alliance now between Saudi Arabia and Israel is that they're much more obsessed about the Iran issue right now uh, at the government level than they are uh, with the Israeli-Palestinian question. All right. Over here, the lady. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine Vargas Avicent. Uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins SIS, I had the privilege of having a general, an army general, come in <clears throat> and speak to my class about uh, Chinese-U.S. military relations. And when he was finished speaking, I asked him, what kind of trust-building exercise could the U.S. and China do together uh, that would be effective? And without skipping a beat, he answered, pirate catching. And I thought, okay. Um, applying that thinking here, what sort of trust-building exercise could the U.S. and Iran do post this particular scenario, let's say it goes well, that would not give Saudi Arabia and Israel heart palpitations, and from a both, well, mostly political as opposed to military uh, standpoint, show the world that the U.S. and Iran can get along in more ways than this? Thank you. I'll just say, and I know Steve would like to comment. Uh, just interesting, uh, when I was involved in these negotiations with the Iranians over the last five years, uh, they would come to us and say, let's spend time working on Syria and Bahrain. Uh, and we said we wouldn't do it. Um, we knew that our Gulf friends would be outraged if we started talking about these sensitive issues without their participation and without their knowledge. So we refused. The one area we said, let's work on anti-piracy together. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank God for pirates. <laughs> Did you want to say something? <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am, right here. There'll always be pirates. Yeah. Hi, Brenda Schaefer at Georgetown University. Um, these sanctions were so successful because a number of allies uh, really took big risks to join the sanctions, especially states that are bordering Iran, like Azerbaijan, uh, Emirates, as, as you mentioned. What's your advice, I'd like to, to, to Mr. Friedman, what's your advice to these countries that sort of put their security on the line for the United States for the sanctions, often in very uncomfortable, risky positions? These countries are already getting the payback from Iran and they have the means for destabilization in Azerbaijan, in, in Emirates, and a variety of Gulf states. What would be your advice to these states and to Washington? Well, yeah, the short answer, I think it's a perfectly legitimate question. I think they've thought this through. They, they deserve the best deal we can get. You know, we, we have to negotiate. Uh, the kind of deal that Bob has been talking about. And um, I think if we do, they will feel that their investment you know, in this process was justified. But I think we, we owe them that. I mean, again, it's why I, I'm, not, I'm not uncomfortable with Netanyahu out there you know, doing his Dr. Strangelove thing and, and the others. You know. Um, uh, you know, it's good to have a little, little crazy on your side you know, when, when uh, you're negotiating in that part of the world. So I... I, I hope they keep the pressure up. I, I, I got no problem with that. Right there. Steve Larrabee Rand, uh, this is to Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, it seems to me that the United States has said that there is no direct and formal relationship between the Iranian nuclear deal and Syria. On the other hand, I think it's inconceivable that it isn't in some way indirectly linked because if the deal goes forward, uh, Iran is going to have to think uh, about any move it makes in uh, Syria or towards Syria, what impact that will have on the negotiating uh, uh, 
uh, on the nuclear deal, and so will the United States. So it seems to me there is an inter uh, a relationship. Do you disagree with that? I agree that there is a relationship. If there is some movement on the Syria issue, it makes it somewhat easier to have some sort of an arrangement regarding the nuclear issue and vice versa. And if you are an Iranian, realizing that your country is in the midst of really significant division regarding its future position in that region, and if you were concerned that American disengagement from Afghanistan might unleash new problems in the region, I think you would want to have a situation in which some sort of stable relationship with the United States uh, is, in fact, uh, a reality. Uh, the Iranians, after all, are very much aware of the fact that they are living in a region in which sectarianism is rising. It can become totally destructive for the entire region, for most of the countries in the region. And hence, some sort of an accommodation, not only with the United States, but an accommodation which involves also China, it involves Russia, it involves Europe, gives them the option of becoming a more seriously viewed and more positively accepted participant in the international process from which they have largely excluded themselves. And I think it's the sense of sudden awakening to the overall consequences of what has been happening over the last 30 years that has stirred the more uh, articulate Iranian public into an increasingly significant revision of their attitudes. All right. uh, Peter Sharfman, MITRE Corporation. Do you think that there is actually enough common ground for a deal? If you were mediating the negotiations, is there an outcome that would be acceptable to Iran with its politics and to the United States with its politics and to our allies with their politics? Who would like to do that? I, I can't do better than the president on 50-50. Uh, it, it's, I mean, the, the gaps really are large. I mean, we have in mind a tiny enrichment program that genuinely is consistent with their very minimal needs. Uh, they talk about you know, 20 big nuclear reactors and so forth, which is an aspiration that will never be achieved. Uh, you know, they want to, uh, to keep this Iraq uh, plutonium production reactor functioning. We think it has only one legitimate purpose. I mean, not legitimate, one, one intended purpose, which is to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Uh, we want it destroyed or turned into a light water reactor. They, uh, we, they have an underground enrichment facility that we thought was going to be part of a covert military program. Uh, we would like it destroyed or repurposed. They want to keep it running. There are huge gaps. Uh, one huge gap is the duration of the final deal. It was papered over in the interim agreement. We talked about they agreed to long-term duration. It's important because at the end of that duration, Iran can have any rights that other non-nuclear weapon states party to the NPT can have. In other words, the special restrictions on enrichment and so forth go away. So the United States wants that length to be 20, 30, or more years. Uh, the Iranians want it in single digits. So these are going to be hard issues uh, to uh, hard differences to bridge. You know, I, I think the, there's a non-technical answer to your question. I think, and um, Zvig alluded to it, um, I think it's how Iran chooses to define its future. Does it want to be a big North Korea, or does it want to be a small China? Does it want to see its future as being a bigger sort of global outlaw, always kind of fighting and bumping up and chafing against its neighbors in the world? Or does it want to define its power as unleashing its remarkable people uh, in a way that will enable them to realize their full potential with a little nuclear program on the side? Let me just add to that, and I agree with every word that Tom said. There is also an American side to that. Uh, what do we want to impose on Iran, and how far are we prepared to go uh, with insistence on arrangements, which in addition to being very strict, can be massively humiliating yeah. and self-destructive, and reverse what to me is an important process of change within Iran, which it is in our interest to reinforce and to make Iran a more constructive player in a part of the world in which we have a variety of interests, all of which are increasingly under stress 
and in which we may be increasingly challenged. And I don't think any of us want to repeat some of the recent experiences we have had in that region. It's hard to think of anything that's damaged our interests more or caused us more grief, expense, um, and wasted energy than the Iran-US Cold War over the last 34 years. So sometimes the ideal can be an enemy of the adequate. And I am in favor of an adequate arrangement with Iran, but not an ideal arrangement, which, yes, is foolproof, absolutely. It's like a fail-safe you know, parachute. It will never fail, which has the effect of forcing someone to commit suicide and take us with them. Right here. This is Marco Di Capua. I'm National Nuclear Security Administration. Is it possible that Iran's perception of its security and environment has radically changed to the point where they have decided they might not need nuclear weapons anymore? Well, I think it's possible, uh, but the question still remains, you know, how much of a leeway do they have in having an essentially peaceful nuclear program? And how strict do we want to be to make sure that under no circumstances ever, ever can they cheat for a while? But the record is that even when the inspections and everything else was much more lax, their attempts to cheat in secrecy failed. It's not a simple process. So that we do have a lot of opportunities to say, hey, wait a minute, you're violating all these arrangements. You're going beyond the spirit. And then you know, return to some arrangement, including threats, including renewed sanctions if we can, and so forth. The Iranians are not suicidal. Let's just get that across. And, because uh, the whole notion that they are ready to commit suicide the moment they get an alleged bomb creates a mental attitude towards this problem, which is self-destructive. It precludes any possibility of a reasonable accommodation. I, I would just add that, ultimately, the only way you get that sure, 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 foolproof thing is when you have a change in the character of the Iranian regime. And part of this whole process is to initiate or to enhance, actually, what has already begun. We saw that with the 2009 Green Revolution of an Iranian effort to change the character of their regime. We, we, you know, we in this country, we saw the Soviet Union die with 80,000 nuclear warheads you know, in its bunker. So ultimately, it was about the change. We do, we do not basically. I, I don't think there's many Americans who don't sleep tonight because they're worried about the Soviet nuclear capability. But in fact, they, they threaten us, okay, if they wanted to. China can threaten us. But when the character of the regime changes, that changes the whole equation. And that's got to be part of the dynamic here. I'll just add to that. Uh, I don't think Great. they made, Marco, I don't think they made a strategic decision not to have nuclear weapons. I think in 2003, when we invaded Iraq, uh, they uh, put on hold one element of their program, you know, the weaponization part. Uh, they didn't abandon nuclear weapons, they deferred it. They were going to wait till the coast is clear. Uh, the coast hasn't cleared, and they saw there are tremendous costs to be paid for being caught cheating and so forth. I still I think it's an open question. It's a nuclear weapons program that's on the shelf. And our job in this agreement is to keep them as far away from a near breakout capability as we can to deter any decision for them to cross the threshold and to keep deterring them from crossing that threshold until there's a basic change in character and they can make that strategic Yeah, decision. I just had one thing. This is a very relevant point, which is that if you ask what's the biggest thing been happening in the Middle East since 2010, okay, it's been a pan-region-wide movement. By, actually, excuse me, since 2009, the Green Revolution of young people throughout the Muslim Middle East realizing they were living in you know, what I call a flat world, where they could see how everybody else was living, just how far behind they were, and demanding governments that enable them to realize their full potential. If you ask me, that's the biggest thing that's been happening. And if you ask me what will define this region in 10 years, it will not be how, many, how much enrichment you know, Iran has or is allowed. It will be whether and how governments respond to that movement in a region where 75% of the population is under the age of 30. Let's not Great. forget that. And this will have to be our final question. Uh, my name is Greg Craig from Skadden. Uh, I wonder if the panel would comment um, on the internal dynamics inside the P5 plus one and whether you have confidence that over the next six months 
we're going to remain on the same page with all our negotiating partners. Uh, under the best of circumstances, this is going to be a very challenging negotiation on diplomatic objective. Uh, there was some reason to believe that there was internal stresses between the P5 plus one as we approached the preparatory agreement. I'd be curious to know what you think about how the P5 plus one are going to work together going forward. Let me just start. Well, the, um, uh, the president has admitted, uh, administration officials have admitted that there was substantial bilateral interaction between the U.S. Uh, and the Iranians uh, in the run-up to the November 24th agreement. Uh, in fact, uh, the piece of paper that was given uh, to the P5 plus one representatives uh, by Catherine Ashton of the EU was, uh, it was a U.S.-Iranian draft with a few bracketed formulations. It had been cooked up in bilateral discussions. Um, this took us a number of our P5 plus one partners by surprise. They would have liked to had a greater role in the production of this document. I think this led to Foreign Minister Fabius's public remarks on that Friday in Geneva. Uh, and I think, but I think they recovered very quickly. Uh, and within 24 hours, they had a consensus text that they gave to the Iranians. But I think going forward, uh, managing that group will be difficult. I think they all realize on the one hand, if it really is going to be progress, it will be the result of U.S.-Iranian bilateral interaction. On the other hand, they have a legitimate role. The EU sanctions played a critical role in moving the Iranian calculus. Uh, at the, also, you have the Russians and Chinese. Uh, who will be happy to have any deal. They're not going to want to be as fussy as we're going to want to be uh, in a final outcome. So I think management going ahead is going to be pretty tricky. I think that by and large, all of the participants in that process on the outside of Iran um, have a shared interest in the situation being resolved and in any case, not letting it slide into a state in which eventually some sort of explosion takes place and massive regional violence erupts. So in that sense, there is consensus. But I think there is a subtle difference, perhaps, in the longer range interests of the Europeans, the Japanese, and us on one side, and the Russians to some extent. The Russians still view us as rivals in that area, and they would like to regain some of their influence. Uh, but at the same time, they don't want to go too far, and they don't want a collision with us. But they may be tempted at some point to take a deviant position. I think the Chinese basically are interested in resolving this issue so there's no violence, because they're interested essentially in a steady flow, steady flow of oil at a reasonable price. And they will have neither if there's an eruption. The Europeans have no choice to go with us, even if occasionally one of them wants to posture a little bit, as the French did, for some other reasons. Uh, the Russians might at some point uh, want to test us. And here, the difference could arise over actually Syria uh, rather than Iran, because the Russians feel they have a particular historical ties with Syria, and they have a role to play. And it's, a, to some extent, a symbolic expression of their regional influence. There's also the potential tie between escalating violence in the region, especially in Syria, and instability in the southern Caucasus. And the Russians there feel very vulnerable. So they have different feelings, mixed feelings, and this is what restrains them, in my view. So that in the end, if push came to shove and I had to say, yes, will they be helpful or will they create problems for us, I would say they probably would be helpful in the sense <coughs> they will all agree that we mustn't rub Iran's nose in the dirt in order to get an agreement. Um, I, I would simply say I think it's a very good question, and it's, um, I, I, I'd make two points. One is something that's been apparent you know, from the start, which is that the sanctions regime disguised multiple and different interests of the parties. And the minute you go from that to cashing it into a final deal, those different interests are going to make themselves apparent. And the question is, is as Bob and Zabig said, how much, you know, what trade-offs? But I, I, I will venture a, a reckless statement, um, uh, which is that I think it's going to be very hard to get a successful deal if we also don't make some progress on Syria. Because it's hard for me to imagine all these actors agreeing on Iran 
and then having a widening Syrian civil war where many of the same parties are contesting one another and acting in ways that are, are very frightening to one another. I think it's going to be hard. So I hope that we both use this six months to get an Iran deal and to find some way to get a ceasefire at a minimum in Syria so neither side sees themselves losing ground in both theaters at the same time. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks to our panelists.